Hey, welcome to the Learning to Lead podcast. I'm joined with the Big Eagle himself, Pastor Brian Houston from Hillsong. And Pastor Brian, it's an honor to have you on this podcast. Honor to have you in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> it's always good to be here. It's always great to be with you. Come on. Well, you're here, you're doing the tour, and you're doing yeah. There's More Tour. Yep. Got the books in the back. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> right behind us. <laughs> so talk a little bit about this tour, the book, and just where this message really stirred in your heart. Yeah, sure. I've always been passionate about Ephesians 3, verse 20. So, you know, got to do exceedingly abundant above anything we could ever ask, think, or imagine. And it's kind of been the way I've tried to live my life, and it's been my own, probably my personal story, just the way I was always a dreamer. I always believed for big things for my life. But I, if someone asked me, when you were young, could you have seen everything that the Lord's opened for us? I would have, you know, in my wildest dreams, I couldn't have imagined mm. from little old New Zealand where I grew up. And so it's really a book that's, encouraging people to believe that God has so much more for them, not more stuff, you know, not more, um, you know, not things that are built on greed, but just more of his purpose, more yeah. of his promise, more of his great will for your life. And I feel like God's will for our life is so much greater than what we see inside of ourselves. Mm. So that's kind of the thesis of the book. Well, I read it and I actually bought it for our whole leadership team and Thanks. we went through it. And it really stirred in our hearts, you know, being in Tulsa, Oklahoma, my dad was such a faith man and faith yes. preacher. Yes. And your book stirs that faith message. We were all sitting at the table, our leadership team, and just really talking about how what you were saying, it just felt like coming back home for us. Because wow. I think this generation maybe got turned off at some point um, by some of the faith message. But I feel like you've, uh. you've packaged this in such a way, what, like you just said, God has more impact for your life, more purpose for your life. Yeah. Uh, more. So talk a little bit about how you've been able to preach and package that message for all generations in 2018. <laughs> That's a big question, and I don't think I've done that intentionally at all. I've just tried to stay true to myself. And, you know, I'm like you. I grew up a pastor's son, and I've always loved the things of God. I've always loved the things of the Spirit. I've always loved... At church especially, you know, I've always loved the church. I feel like the church has so often lived below its potential. Mm. But I, you know, to me, authenticity is real. And so to me, I think it's what is important is, yes, we live by the word of God and we absolutely believe in the power of faith and have an expectation for God, like I say, to do more than we could ever imagine. But to me, it's... Uh, you know, it's just living your life authentic, being true to yourself. And I, yeah. think, I think hopefully that's what leaks out of me. Oh, it's totally, yeah, it's very authentic, very powerful, feels so genuine reading it. And, you know, one of the things that I love about you is you're, you're a leader of leaders. You, I feel like I listen to your leadership podcast. And I feel like I'm learning all the time, culture, vision, mission, and it leaks through your book too. But talk a little bit about this is a podcast for young leaders uh -huh. and young leaders that aspire the Ephesians 3:20 aspire that there's more for their life and uh -huh. maybe talk a little bit on the leadership nugget for people out there that are thinking how can I how can I be the leader I'm called to be how can I grow in that well it's a great question and I think maybe there's not even just one answer to that we can say the obvious things like live as an example you know but honestly I think the big things would be dig deep wherever you are. Mm. In other words, don't just try and run after the big thing and where you think you're going to get the best chance to be a leader, but dig deep where you are, presuming that's a place where you can flourish. And even in the good times and tough times, dig deep there. Uh, understand that life's long and life's short. Life's long in the sense that we've got a long time to stay encouraged, a long time to keep our testimony, a long time. Uh, to not get cynical and so on, but it's short. Uh, the Bible describes it like a vapor. And I'm already at the age 64 where I'm seeing that. Like, you know, I was a, one of the young guys just a couple of weeks ago, and now all of a sudden I'm one of the older guys, not old. But, uh, and, and so to me, you know, live that way. Don't feel like it's all going to happen tomorrow. Mm. Understand that, uh, you know, longevity and consistency, it's amazing where you end up. And if I, in terms of everything I felt was inside of me, 
had a judge that after a decade, I would have been mighty discouraged because I came out of Bible college. All my friends sort of got, you know, opportunities in churches and so on. And I was working as a salesperson and volunteering and working in youth ministry and so on. And so, uh, yeah, I, I would just say you've got to be in it for the long haul. You've got to understand the power of your testimony. You've got to live your life with a commitment that uh, I want to. I want to be with the people whose spirit and uh, you know the grace on their life rubs off on me. Mm. I think that's really important. Don't don't yeah. be a lone ranger. That's really good. You know, when I whenever you first and I whenever you and I first met, 2015, um, you came to speak here, and you had spoken here when I was a little boy. But we had never really met, and when you came in 2015, I just stepped in as pastor. And I remember just, you know, asking you to impart everything you could to me. And I was receiving it, soaking in it. Now, it's 2018. Yeah. I've been in this role for three or four years now. And there's things inside me that there's tension where I'm like, I want to be further by now. I want <laughs> our church to be, I, you know, you look to the left and to the right, you get in the comparison trap. And like you said, life is long, life is short, but this generation is the Instagram generation. Sure we want is. we want to see instant, you know, validation, instant affirmation. We want to know that what we're doing is progressing, it's getting bigger, more followers, whatever, instant, you know, the the influence. What would you say to me or to other guys out there that deal with that comparison trap or have to fight that yeah. in the urge to want to grow more faster? It's, it's human nature. I think all of us have to decide that we're not going to get caught up in that. And I feel like, uh, like you said, social media, Instagram and so on, uh, it really feeds those things inside of people. I've never, I've never seen God work one way with everyone. In other words, some people, they're overnight successes. And then maybe things level off and they spend a lot of their lives frustrated because of lack of momentum. Other guys, they're just slow burners. They're just going along, steady growth, a little each year. And one day, whatever, boom, you know, something explodes. And I think it's a matter of trust. I think it's a matter of trusting God and realizing God's hand on your life. But I watch all your preaching clips, of which oh, there's a no. lot, on, uh, <laughs> on Instagram. And it looks to me, I look out at the crowd because I'm a pastor. We always look at the crowd. Yeah. And it looks to me like you're doing pretty well, to be honest with you. Thanks, Pastor <laughs> But, you know, I think, like, your book, it stirs in me that we're not doing what everything we could do. I think on the other side of Ephesians 3.20, there's Philippians 4.11. I've learned the secret to be content where I'm at. But it's like, I feel like there's this tension of you want to be content, but you want to be hungry. Yeah. You want to be thirsty for more. You want to believe that, yeah, I'm content, but... I believe God has more for our church. Yeah, he has. So what do you think that tension requires of being content but staying hungry? Not striving. Being mm. at peace, relaxing, giving your absolute best. Uh, you know, st staying uh, free of striving so that you've got all your creative juices going and, uh, you know, you don't sort of st st stiffen up on all of that because you're pushing too hard, striving too hard. And, uh, you know, I've always thought of that my whole life. It's never fast enough for me. And so I know the family, especially when we're pastoring, because what we're looking at is reality, week by week, month by month, person by person, uh, discouragement by discouragement, someone we really believed in, you know, sadly, it didn't work out the way we expect. Mm. And then you get these people who you would never have imagined there was a future with you, with that person. And they just emerge and rise up. And mm. it's just riding, it's, it's riding the waves, really. And it's the big picture it really is trusting God. And I have no doubt that you and Ashley, uh, I think one day you'll be looking back at the faithfulness of God, also saying, I could never have imagined mm. when we started in Tulsa that. God would open all of this to us. Wow. Man, I pray so. You know, I think about just uh, so many lessons you've taught on leadership and culture for Hillsong. What, like, if you were telling leaders today what to focus on, a few areas in their organization or business or church, that you would say, this is really important that you focus on this personally or organizationally, 
that will lead to the more that God has for you? Yeah, that's another big, broad question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. You want me to, you want about, me to get it more specific? There's about five messages in there uh, at least. <laughs> I'm trying to yeah. get as much as I can in this time with you. Yeah. Um, what would I say if I was to bring it down to one thought, one thing? Or it could be three or four things. Right. Yeah, and I'm struggling with one at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, honestly, leadership, it really is. It really is building the kind of life, being the kind of person that inspires people to want to follow you. Mm. And so whether you're in business or or whether it's not a matter of employees, it's not a matter of staff, it's not a matter of people I hire, it's a matter of me building around me people who believe 100% in what I'm about. So in other words, they just catch on to the vision and the mission and they they love you and they believe in you and you have that ability in all of that to keep lifting the ceilings for people because that's how you have longevity with key people. Mm. Uh, if people have got a lot of potential they're hitting ceilings so, sooner enough, sooner or later rather, they're gonna have to you know, do something else to fulfill their potential. So that ability to lift ceilings, I've been blessed, Bobby and I have been graced with incredible longevity in our key team with significant people. Many of them have very significant ministries of their own. And I think that being able to inspire people to believe that mm. you believe in them, even when you have to have a straight conversation with someone, mm. but the bottom line is they receive it because, well, at my age, you're a dad to them. Yeah, you're right. a, Bobby and I are kind of like mums and dads to people, which is a great time in life, by the way. And so I love that scripture when I think of leadership, Psalm 92, 13, that all pastors love because it talks about those who are planted in the house of the Lord yes. shall flourish in the courts of the Lord. But let's turn it around. It's the will of God for the people in your church and in our church to flourish. Yeah. So if they can't flourish, why would they stay planted? Mm. And so I would say that with any area of leadership, any area of life, whatever sphere you're in, Build the kind of environment where people can flourish. And then you'll, you'll be amazed at how their being able to be blessed and their being successful is going to elevate you towards your dreams. Come on. That right there. <laughs> that right there. That was powerful. That was gold. Because I think, yes, like the, the well, I look at you and you're surrounded by long-term people, people yes. that have been with you and Bobby 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 well, plus yeah, years. Yeah, mostly, most of our very key people, virtually for the whole journey. Since 80, 1981? Yeah. 83. 83. 83, yeah. Okay, so. Not all of them have been there literally since 83, but many from the 80s and the 90s who, like I say, these days, uh, they, what, what God's doing in their own lives is amazing. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is another thing. People should never, ever underestimate how much of the grace that is on your life is attached to what you're part of. Mm. So I think people in, in an environment where everything's moving, there's momentum, there's blessing, they can easily think, well, you know, I'm pretty good. Mm. And not understand mm. how much of that connects to who you're connected with and the momentum and the blessing that's on that. I've seen too many people make that mistake and suddenly they're not quite as good as they thought they were when they're on their own mm. and it becomes a long, hard road. <laughs> You taught on that once. Do you, I remember listening to it? Is that would that be a lesson you would teach every year, dating back to the '80s, or did you kind of gradually start talking about that a little longer in the yeah, ministry? I certainly don't do that. I certainly don't think every year I've got to cover this, 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 and this again. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad thing to do, but I, I always speak to our staff, which I've been doing for 35 years every every week without missing a week, we, wow. we have our staff meeting. Mm -hmm. And it started with just a few guys sitting on the floor in my lounge room all those years ago. And of course, these days, it's a, a big, big crowd of people. Um, so I can't remember what I was talking about. Well, basically <laughs> picking what topic to talk to your staff on sorry. that you don't yeah, yeah. necessarily feel like yes. you have to talk on the faithfulness topic every year. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I just really speak on what I sense right now. Mm -hmm. And it might be some of those messages, it might be 10 years or maybe never again. Uh, but it really is a matter of what I, I look at 
where we're at and what's happening and you know maybe there's a, a, a part of church life where there's just too much tension people are too stressy there's too much drama so that kind of thing would spark a leadership talk in me to our team about growing your capacity leadership capacity mm -hmm. and things like that what is your most favorite topic to preach on <laughs> purpose probably purpose yeah basically your heart god works from the inside out uh, you know, keep your heart with all diligence out from it, springs the issues of life, just underpan understanding the importance of you know, having the kind of spirit, the kind of heart that will keep opening doors for you. I never forget when I really first had my, you know, breakthrough, but opportunity in America. I looked at America. I felt like God had called me to have an impact and an influence in this country. And I sat mm -hmm. on a park bench on Sunset Boulevard in LA looking over the city. Mm -hmm. Thinking to myself, I cannot see how that could possibly happen. Mm. Nobody knows who I am. I'm an Australian. No one knew then Hillsong Worship. I couldn't see how it could possibly happen. And I, I met up with the pastor you know, Casey Treat, who out of nowhere invites me to speak in this conference. And you've got to understand, the people I was speaking with, to me, were like heroes. I was so intimidated. I was so out of my depth. I mean, I was young still. And I asked him after, I said, you've never heard me preach. Why did you ask me to come and speak at your conference? And he said, I like your spirit. Mm. And you know, your spirit opens so many doors for you. Wow. Keeping a sweet spirit, not allowing yourself to get jaded, not becoming critical, not becoming cynical. You know, a free spirit is everything, I think. Wow. So in your life, you've been pastoring for how many years now? Leading the ministry. <laughs> well, I, I would say 40. I actually 40 went to Bible years. College in 1972, so that's uh, a long time ago, 46 years or so ago, uh, which is crazy, by the way, as well, because you hear old guys say those things and you think, 46? And it all it comes around just too Starts quickly. Coming. Yeah. <laughs> so if you were to go back to, uh, you know, 30, 33 year old Pastor Brian at that time, if you could just talk to him, what would you say to him right now? Yeah, well, I started our church when I was 29. Bobby was 26. I'd already planted two other churches before that. And I was like, you just explained about yourself. I was just, uh, I just wanted it all to happen now, you know, and I was just never quite satisfied. I'd get too, too moved by the bad weekends. It would just affect me too badly and so on. And that feels good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like yeah. I'm not that messed up. I've got better at that. I'm still not all the way there, but I've got better at understanding, hey, next weekend's a new opportunity. Mm -hmm. Not getting too ruled by the ups and downs of the flow of church life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've become, a, I've become less hard on myself and less hard on my staff mm -hmm. on some of those things. I think I would basically say don't strive. Be so who so you how are. do you do that? How do you just not strive? Well, you get to 65 and you look back <laughs> and you think I strived far too much. <laughs> how would you define striving versus working hard in a peaceful yeah. way? Well, I'm still highly motivated. Ambition, you know, the Bible talks about selfish ambition, which is not good. But I think holy ambition is awesome. Mm. I'm still very ambitious at my age. I'm still thinking the future. and Thinking big, thinking where we're absolutely. going. Absolutely. Like, I'm never 100%. DC. Never a hundred percent DC. Where did Washington, that come DC. from? I don't know. I'm just thinking of cities <laughs> that might be in your heart, mine, future. Uh, yeah, it's not one that's quite <laughs> in the heart right now. <laughs> Sorry if you live in DC. I love you, and you never say never. <laughs> Uh, you, you just rocked me again. I can't remember what we talked I'm talking. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, you were the talking DCs. about uh, the, the, the difference between striving and yeah. living with holy yeah. ambition. I think it's important. I think it's important that you have a sense of God's got something more for me. I want to rise up and fulfill his purpose for my life. I'm not going to be mediocre. I'm not going to settle with mediocrity. But it's where it comes from. You know what? The, you know when you're really striving, you, everything becomes tense. Mm. You can always tell when I'm not comfortable preaching because my spontaneity disappears. Mm. All of a sudden, uh, you know, my veins on my neck pop up a little bit more, and I'm just not having as much fun. So, it's the same with life, I think. Wow! By God's grace, I've got so much better at not having those experiences so much, but. Uh, 
Yeah, I think it's the same in life. The moment you start striving, everything tenses up. You also tense up your team. Mm. You tense up the atmosphere. You tense up the environment. And just learning how to breathe. Yeah. And like I always, like I've been saying to you, understand you don't have to win every battle tomorrow. That's really good. Well, I think we got just five more minutes left before we gotta close up. But what would you say is like the most recent? lesson or tension that you've been wrestling with on leadership or even just on church life that's kind of like a most recent fresh passion of yours <laughs> i just talked about actually i i've been talking to our staff now i think i've done five different uh leadership talks on on just leadership capacity i look at too many young people who are stressed and striving and i think to myself if you're stressed with the level of opportunity and responsibility you've got now. How on earth are you gonna grow into all that God's got mm. for you? So I think that's what I'm passionate about for our own church, our own mm -hmm. team, our own stuff right now, is just growing your capacity. And maybe it's easier said than done. Uh, you know, stress is normal. It's, it's not a bad thing. Distress and stress to me are not the same thing. Mm. Distress is when you're anx anxious, you're, you're worrying, you know, you can even go down into depression and so on. That's distress to me. Stress, stress is a part of life. There's always things happening that, that are tensions, mm -hmm. but not all tension, as you know, is evil. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's, uh, it, to me, that's really what's on my heart right now. People have to keep growing as people uh, else that's going to limit them. Mm -hmm. If you, if people are burning out, and I've been through a bad period in my life, so I'm not judging anyone, uh, but if people are burning out when they're young and, and they don't have a lot, they have to learn how to live different. Not maybe even be less busy, just live different. And again, it's where it's all coming from in here. Mm -hmm. And I know you can't answer that in five minutes, but like in one way for for me to to expand my capacity to uh, expand my help my internal health so that I can step into the more what would be just one thought on how I could do that that maybe you shared with your staff hmm. uh, to distress to de-stress the distress yeah and I know it's tough to answer on the spot on that I'm actually trying to remember my own message on it. That's what I'm trying to do. But look, I I, I did a a talk uh, from the very well-known story in Numbers 13 and 14. So the 10 spies and you know, the two spies and mm -hmm. the fact that no one even knows. If, if I call, re read the list of the 10, the names no one's ever heard of, but the two, of course, most people who have any awareness of the scriptures have heard of, Joshua and Caleb, and in the, when at the beginning of that story, there's six questions. And the six questions are things like, are the people, you know, big or small? Uh, you know, the villages, are the, are the cities fortified or are they open fields? All these questions. And, you know, 10 of them, they always saw the worst. You know, they said, if we go in there, our children are going to be devoured. Our wives and our children are going to be devoured. Uh, Whereas Caleb is, this is a wonderful land. Mm. This is, you know, he said, this is a wonderful land, especially in the New Living Translation. I, I love, love that. it. And so I think a lot of it, and, and on that whole thing, you know, people, they want to look after their children. They're too scared to step out of faith, take the risk, because, you know, we want to keep our kids secure, routine. And I'm saying, do it for the kids. Mm. You know, look, my kids, you, your dad, your mum, and the way they lived, you know, and stepped out in faith. Wow. And look at you now. Wow. And sadly, it talks about the 10 and how the children would wander around in the spiritual wilderness, wow. which they did for 40 years, of course. And how many people do I know who are wandering, their children are wandering in the spiritual wilderness because they wouldn't step out and live by faith and stretch and so wow. on. And so, yeah, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great lesson. Just those six questions that, you know, Moses asked them and the way they responded. And then sadly, look at uh, Canaan's children were promised your descendants will, will have their share in the, their full portion of the land. The other guys. And so I'm saying, doing it for the kids, do it Take for the, the generations, risk. Take the risk. And trying to inspire people to, uh, you know, 
stretch out. Stretch your lungs. What's you can breathe deeper. We're, we just, God challenged me at the start of this year to believe God that we were going to expand as a church. And, um, and we, had, you know, we had started two campuses, one in downtown Tulsa, one in Manford, and then our central one here. But God said, believe that you're going to sell that, that building down the road, and then you're going to raise an extra $4 million to build something new here. So, so I've been wrestling with the fear of like, oh, I just don't know if I can raise that in this day and age. And I don't know, you know, half our church now is a lot younger than it was four years ago because of my age. It's just it's that younger audience is not as wealthy as my parents' audience that can necessarily fund that vision. They're not like now. I, They're not now, but one day they will be. Come on in Jesus' name. You, you think right. about that because people always said when we started, you know, there's young people. Young people don't give. Mm. And I'm thinking, yes, they do. Yeah. You invest in them for long enough, yeah. and they'll be the greatest givers. Some of the greatest givers in our church are literally out of our youth ministry. Come on. Yeah. So about a month ago, it all happened. And Or you made an offer um, with a very generous family that helped uh, buy that building. And then I got up in front of the church, and I heard God say, Paul, take the risk because one day your little Liam, my four-year-old, yeah. is going to be in that building. And so I got up in front of our church and I said, we got to believe God for 11 million. The good news is 7 million's coming with the sale of that building. We got four to raise. And that Sunday, a big giver came up and, and he's a young guy. But he said, I want to sow the first $100,000 this weekend. That's great. And, it, you know, the, the, but what you're saying is so true. If we'll step out and take a risk, uh, now we've got enough, a lot more to raise. But yeah. I think I get excited reading your book. I get excited yeah. thinking about the message you're going to preach tonight in this tour. Uh, but for everyone who's watching, please go get the book. There is more. Pastor Brian's book, so good. His latest book. Is this your favorite book you've ever written? It actually is. And Come I think it's other people would say the same thing, that it's the best book I've written. Yeah, and it, yeah. it tells your story. It, it What we're talking about, there's so much more. If you're not listening to his leadership podcast... I don't know where you've been the last three years. <laughs> this podcast is amazing. It's full of just incredible gold of leadership nuggets. Pastor Brian, thanks so much. Thank you. All Always right. good. Stay tuned right here. God bless you. <laughs> He's awesome. <laughs>